Good morning. My name is Jenny. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so excited to see you. People who are here in the sanctuary, you have memorized the route. You knew exactly when to exit. And then is it 5th and Forest Street Park and Summit and 7th and 10th? Something like that. I'm so excited that you made it through the uh, marathon uh, traffic. We have a wonderful group of volunteers right now uh, on 5th and Houston. That is, here we are. Some of them made it into the sanctuary that are serving at the hydration station, and they are greeting the runners and just uh, spreading the goodness in the downtown Fort Worth. What a blessing. If you worship with us online, I'm so excited that you have taken the time at your home or wherever you are to create a sacred space where you will be worshiping with us in spirit, singing, listening to the sermon, praying, taking notes, doing all of the important things, and you can do all of that in your pajamas. What a wonderful opportunity. Uh, and um, uh, now I do invite you to stand up and we will start our worship service with call to worship. In this important season, we learn that we are important to God and that each person is valued. So lay down titles and positions and pick up the threads of fellowship and joining with our neighbors. Let us worship God who calls one and all to join him in the journey of love. What is the greatest gift of life? To know we are made in the image of God. What does that require of us? To love our neighbor as ourselves. Where does that take us? To a place where we see all are equal. Come then to worship in that place where God's people find the fullness of life and learn to share its fullness with others. Amen. Stay, stay, don't, don't sit down, don't sit down. We're going to do one more warm greeting for those of you who are in the sanctuary. Let's pass the peace. Let's look around and greet people who are right there next to you. Greet them. Welcome them to this place of worship. Friends, as you finish passing the peace this morning, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Jackson Christian Berry, and I'm filling in for Mr. Clint Church today. Um, I am so honored to be here. Lance and I had the chance to go and uh, lead worship for the marathoners this morning, which was uh, an experience, to say the least. Yeah. An experience. Um, to, to meet people who are very, very awake at 5.30 in the morning, 5 in the morning, not my kind of people, y'all. I'm just going to be real frank with you. Not my kind of people. So uh, it was an experience. It was very fun. I just reminded me of what I said the very first time I got to fill in for Clint, which is that this church's heart for its community is my favorite thing to see in action. It is a gift to be in this church. Amen. I'm sorry, church. Amen. Amen. That's right. What do you say we do some singing as we praise the Lord this morning? Come on. We sing, I sir. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. And man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. But then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Because there's nothing like that love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better. Still call me friend. 
Does the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley And there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Come on Cause there's not Better than you There's not Better than you Lord There's not Nothing is better than you We'll sing it again just like that There's nothing Continue in worship this morning, singing all throughout my history. Sing it together. And all throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. And when our storms make way for spring, and every season. From where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises and fulfillment all over Help me remember. 
and that God hears and responds to our prayers. And during this time of prayer, there'll be a number of places where I'll use the phrase, Lord in your mercy, and our response together is, hear our prayer. I will be naming the first names of people toward the end of the prayer, and then I'll say, are there any others? And it'll be a chance for any of you who out loud would like to say the name of a person or more than one person who's on your heart today, please feel free to add that person to this prayer. Let us pray. Oh, loving God, we give you thanks for this new day. And on this day, with the theme in our community, we thank you for helping us to be healthy in body, mind, and spirit. And in our gratitude, we also confess that sometimes our desires get in the way of our ability to be well because sometimes we put ourselves over others. We know we shouldn't. We don't feel good about it. And God, we know that you forgive us and that you call us to a better way, a new way. And for that, we give you thanks. Father God, you're the creator of all things and you call them good. Your creation testifies about your power, grace, and love. You offer us new lives, new hopes, and new opportunities. For all these things, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Everything that you create, you make free. But over and over again, our freedom is used for the purposes of sin and separation from you. And yet, at our worst, you never abandon us. You come alongside us as Jesus the Christ to redeem, reconcile, and restore us to relationship with you forever. For this salvation, we give you thanks, O God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Always and everywhere, we are never alone. Through your Holy Spirit, you guide us, inspire us, and shine a light before our feet so that we may learn to walk in your ways. For this constant presence, we give you thanks, O God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Len, Daryl, Bliss, Chuck, Carrie, Mandy, Sharon, and Barbara, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Are there others? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For all who seek to change their hearts and find peace in you, guide us, keep us, and make us into your people. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. I want to invite our ushers to prepare for the morning offering. And as they do that, we want to say thank you for your generosity that allows the season of Lent to take place. You know, all these weekly opportunities in our church, the gift of technology, the, the daily Lenten devotion podcast, the My FUMC app where you can discover messages related to Lent, and then looking ahead just a little bit when we get to Holy Week, think of all the opportunities for children, youth, and adults and it's because of you and your generosity, and we thank you. Now allow me to pray. 
Oh God, for these gifts and for each person here, we are grateful and we offer our thanks in Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. My name is Karma Anderson, and I'm going to be reading the scripture reading for today. It comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 to 52. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition, and invite you to read along in your own Bible or one of the Pew Bibles in front of you. The scripture is on page 47 in the New Testament of the Pew Bible. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Appoint us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, the drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to appoint. It is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the 10 heard this, they began to get angry with James and John. So Jesus called to them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Instead, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be the first among you must be the slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. They came to Jericho as he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho. Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said to him, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his coat, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has been made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. God speaks to us through the reading of scripture. Thanks be to God. There were three men who wanted something. Three men who wanted something from Jesus. Two men came confidently from his closest circle. One man shouted from afar, a stranger in a crowd. The two men came and demanded, Jesus, do what we ask. The one man came and begged, Jesus, have mercy. When others heard the demand of the two men, they were indignant and angry. When others heard the cry of the one man, they rebuked him and told him to be quiet. Jesus was easily approached by the two men. Unbeckoned, they came. Jesus was out of reach to the one man, but Jesus stopped for the one man and said, call him, and he came. The two men wanted to be seen. The one man wanted to see. The two men wanted glory. The one man wanted to see. The two men wanted places of honor. The one man wanted to see. Jesus raised many questions with the two men. Jesus demonstrated a straight answer for the one man. Eventually, Jesus said to the two men, no, I can't give you what you demand. Immediately, Jesus said to the one man, yes, I can give you what you ask. Jesus, with many words, reasoned with the two men that their minds might be changed. Jesus, with few words, released the one man that his life might be changed. The two men heard, and they didn't get it. The one man heard, and he got it. And the two men followed Jesus on the way. And the one man followed Jesus on the way. There were three men who wanted something. And they followed Jesus on the way. 
Amen. Before we consider today's scripture reading and today's message, I want to thank everyone who's a part of worship this morning. I can't remember if Jenya mentioned it this morning. In the event that she forgot to, I want to draw your attention to the end of each one of your pews. There is a black binder located there. If you would play, please make note of your attendance and pass it to any of people that are next to you. We'd love to know that you were actually able to navigate your way through marathon traffic this morning. I also want to draw your attention in each one of those binders is a prayer request. And of course, we receive those and do pray over those. These are the prayer requests that we received last week. We've been privileged to join you in prayer over these concerns over the course of the last week. And I'd like to lay these prayer requests at the foot of the cross as a sign and a symbol of God's presence with you and those whom you love when times of prayer are needed. Uh, it is an exciting day here at the church. There is so much going on. At the 11 o'clock service, when Mr. Mark is doing a children's moment and leading the congregation in participation, one of the things that he says over and over again is, I love that this is a, communi- uh, a congregation that loves to say yes, that loves to play, that loves to have fun. And one of the things that's really important to me as the senior pastor of this church is that we are a part of the community of downtown Fort Worth, that we are a part of the fun, that we are a part of the good time. So last year we partnered with the marathon in a couple of different ways. We had a prayer request station. We passed out thousands of fanny packs because nothing says cool and relevant in 2023 like fanny packs. But those are used by the runners to carry their supplies, so it was a good gift, and they used them. And then we also have over at 5th Street in Henderson, over the course of this morning, about 60 different volunteers from our church will be passing out water and Gatorade. I went out and said hey with them, and I was with them right as the elites were starting to come by, you know, the superhuman runners. And you could hear our group cheering from five blocks away. It was so cool. And it's really funny because our water station is manned by two groups. The First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth and a liquor distributor. (laughs) But it was funny because I was talking with the employees of that distributor who are here to volunteer. And I said, did you know that you were going to be partnered up with the church? And they said, we did because the people who came last year and volunteered said, y'all were here and were amazing. And we're so much fun to be with and spend time with. So we were excited to come knowing that y'all are such a great part of this party. And so we've got volunteers out there all morning long. It's so great. I'm so thankful for that. I also want to say special words of appreciation to Jackson, to Thomas Williams, who is the director of our traditional worship service. He's leading a guest choir upstairs this morning. Allison Alvarado, who came to run slides. Her husband, Dave, who came to help. Angie Parrish, our director of hospitality. Uh, All of us were there at 5 a.m. this morning. Uh, to be a part of the worship service that the marathon has before the actual race begins. And it was a very interesting preaching environment because it was inside the big Texas hall at the Amon Carter Event Center there, right down in the middle of where the marathon starts. And right in front of me were about 60 people who were there and they were in chairs and they were locked in and they were a great congregation. And there were about 600 people who could not have cared less and we're all talking. And so if y'all would, if about 40 of y'all would just stand up and start loudly talking and walking around, I would feel a lot more comfortable. (laughs) That would really help me this morning. But one of the things I love to do is try to find opportunities for families to serve together. And I just want to share a couple more that are coming up with you. One of the things that we started last year uh, and we want to do again is give away a special gift of breakfast to the members of our working community, our neighbors downtown. So in Burnett Park, right over by uh, the Burnett Building, the largest building here in Fort Worth on Holy Week, we will be passing out free breakfast, coffee and breakfast tacos to all of the downtown workers. It is a blast. It's a great service opportunity for you or any kids that you have in your family. It is so much fun. So we're going to be doing that again. If you would like to participate after the service, if you come up to on ramp and tell Angie Parrish that she would love to have you sign up. I also want to think about all the time, the ways in which our church can help people in our community in ways that really meet their needs and maybe even in ways that churches might not be thinking about. And do you remember last summer when it was like a hundred bazillion degrees? It was like a really hot summer last year. 
one of the things that it, it really brought home to me was uh, something I've been aware of for a long time, which is that lower income communities tend to be physically hotter than high income communities because of the lack of tree coverage. The lack of presence of trees in lower income communities means it's hotter, it's more unpleasant to work there. And especially if you're walking or using public transit, that's especially hard. And so we've been partnering with the city of Fort Worth and Meadowbrook United Methodist Church on the east side of Fort Worth to have hundreds of trees made available for low-income families in a uh, harder-to-serve community on the east side of Fort Worth. And so we've got a volunteer opportunity for you and your family coming up in May to be a part of distributing trees for families that are coming, picking up, and to be a part of tree planting for some people who aren't able to do so. So over the course of doing this, we're going to be a part of foresting a low-income area here in the city of Fort Worth just to raise the quality of life of the people who live there, our neighbors here in the city as a sign of Christ's love for them. So I just want to share with you all those opportunities. I love being a part of a church that says yes, that's always up for a party. It means so much to me uh, to be a part of you. And, you know, you can't prepare for a whole sermon that is during marathon week and when you're talking to marathon people without thinking a little bit about marathons and running. And I don't know if you guys know this, uh, I used to be a runner. I ran 5Ks. I ran 10Ks. I ran half marathons. I even ran the Chicago Marathon. Uh, what I don't tell people, I tell people all the time, like, yeah, I ran the Chicago Marathon. Uh, what I don't tell people is I ran the Chicago Marathon in the exact same time as Oprah that year. So <laughs> that's my level of speed, and I'm very comfortable with that. And it was interesting that I ever became a runner, though, because I grew up as a competitive athlete in junior high and high school, and I played soccer, and my position was expected to play the entire 90 minutes. That was the expectation for the position that I played. So cardio and vascular endurance was important, which means the only way that I'm going to get to be on the field is if I can play the entire game. And so in part of preparing for that, I have to run. Coach made me run and I hated running. I hated running. I liked soccer, which is why I signed up for soccer. I don't like to run, which is why I didn't sign up for run class. But here I am running, and I hated it. I hated doing it. I hated how it made me feel. I dreaded beforehand. I loved soccer. I hated running, but I had to run so that I could get to play soccer. I thought I hated to run. After college, I'm out in the real world, and I'm not playing competitive sports anymore because it's a different phase of life now. And I, I kind of uh, get involved with some coworkers who are running. And as a social experiment, I start to go along with them. And I'm still in okay enough shape where I can kind of join them for some shorter runs and things like that. But something starts to happen in me when I'm now running with them. Beforehand, running was something that I hated to do, that I had to do in order to get to do the thing that I wanted to do. But now I'm just running. And something's happening. I'm starting to experience what other people are describing as the joy of running. I'm not running and being measured. I'm not running and having to be a time. I'm not running with a coach yelling at me. I'm just running for the sake of loving exercise. I'm just running for the sake of moving. I start to get that like feeling of strength when you start to improve and get better at something. I mean, I'll remember, I never will forget that feeling when like four miles became easy. Like that was such a cool feeling. And then I start to kind of experience those runner's endorphins and those are addictive, dude. That is a real thing. I start to feel that. And I even start to feel the experience of like, yeah, you know, I just went for a 16 mile run and that was long, but like what a better way to spend the afternoon than just sitting around and doing nothing, right? I started to experience that joy that you only get when you are completely exhausted, when you are 100% poured out, but the thing that you poured yourself into was worth it. Do you know that feeling? I have poured myself out. I am empty. I am worn out. I am tired. But the thing that I just gave all that energy to was worth it. And so I experienced the transition from running from something I had to do to something I got to do. Man, I really thought that was going to make a connection with those runners this morning. <laughs> I don't know if it did or not. 
but it made sense to me. And that may seem like an awkward transition in today's scripture reading, but I want to explain why I think they actually really connect. So this scripture reading is James and John. They are referred to as the sons of Debedee to separate them from some other people who have similar names. They're two of Jesus' closest followers. Not only are they a part of the Twelve, the group that's going to go out and be the apostles who established the early church around the world, they're also kind of a smaller group as well with Peter, James, and John. The three of them get to be a part of things that not everybody else does. They're a part of the resurrection of of a young girl. They're the ones who are present to actually see the transfiguration, the revelation of Christ and his divine nature. They have come to understand themselves as being on kind of the inside. And it's important to understand the chronology, where this is happening in the course of the gospel story. So this is the season of Lent. We are leading up to Easter, and that's also what's happening in the scriptures. We're starting to move from the area of Galilee in the northern section of Israel, headed down to Jerusalem. And Jesus knows that where he's going is going to culminate in his crucifixion and his resurrection. And he's continuing to repeat to them, I need you to understand that what is going to happen is I will be killed, I will die, and I will rise again in three days. And his disciples continue to not see what he's actually doing. They continue to not actually understand. And it's so interesting when you read the interactions that are happening between Jesus and the people who come to him, that so often the people who come to him have a real agenda. They really want something out of this conversation with him. Sometimes these teachers are trying to trip him up or mess him up. Sometimes people are trying to get him to confirm what they already believe, already want, already want to do. Or they're trying to get to some end goal, and they want to know, what do I have to do to get what I want from you? I'm so thankful to Pastor Samuel. He preached last week, and if you'll remember that story, it's a famous one. The rich young ruler. What do I have to do to get eternal life? I want eternal life. That's my goal. That's what I want. What do you need? What do I have to do to get it? What do I have to do to earn it? What, like, what's the plan? What's the program? What do I have to do to get what I want? People all the time have this approach to Jesus. What do I have to do to get what I want? James and John, at this point, they've even moved past what do I have to do. They just walk up to Jesus. Jesus, uh, real quick, we want you to give us whatever we want. Anybody here, anybody here parents? <laughs> anybody here feel like they hear that every once in a while? Hey, Dad, 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 Dad real quick. Uh, I want you to give me what I want like in advance. That's exactly what happens. So my, my, my dad responds immediately hearing that text is, Ugh. Jesus hears him out. What do you want? And they move past, hey, what do we need to do to get what we want? They just say what we want. We want to be at your right hand and your left when you come into your glory, which is cultural shorthand for them for, we recognize that you're the greatest. We want to be 1A. Right? We want to be the greatest on the side. We want recognition. We want acclaim. We want power. We want authority. We want to be special and set aside. And it's so interesting that they would say that, right? Because they are not only among the huge crowd of people that are following Jesus, they are not only already special and set aside as a group of the twelve, but inside the group of the twelve, they are two of the three who have a closer relationship with Jesus than anybody else, and they yet still want more, more recognition, more power, more special, more different than everybody else. Man, that speaks to the human condition. Nothing's ever enough if that's what you want. And instead of just slamming them, instead of just embarrassing them, instead of just showing how clearly they fail to see what the entire Jesus experience is about is, he says, this is what's required of real greatness, that you be a servant of all. You want to be great. Well, first of all, you don't know what great even really is. You think it's a claim. You think it's power. You think it's being made set apart and special and different. It's actually 
service. It's actually humility. It's actually generosity. It's actually compassion. It's actually listening. It's actually making yourself available for the goodness of other people's lives. That's what it actually is. And it's so funny because basically what he's telling him is what you've heard from churches your entire life. This is what it is to be a Christian. This is the disciplined way it is to live. This is how it is to orient your heart. This is how it is to arrange your life morally. This is how it is to prioritize your finances. This is how it is to prioritize your time. This is how it is to prioritize your wants and desires in alignment with Christ and his kingdom. And if your only goal is to do those things so that you can get something from Jesus, you will always be miserable. If the only reason that you are being nice, if the only reason that you are showing compassion, if the only reason that you are listening to others, if the only reason that you are giving sacrificially, if the only reason that you are living in a way that pours out all that you have for the benefit of others so that you can get what you want, you will always be like the exhausted 16-year-old who's running just so he can make the team and who hates it. James and John are done with it. Just give us the glory at this point, they say. Mark is a genius in writing his gospel. Mark is a genius. And he places these stories side by side on purpose. They are geographically connected. This is the next chapter. But he's showing you something incredible. On the side of the road, someone who's never had a chance to actually encounter Christ before, someone who's been left behind by his entire community, someone who can't provide for himself, someone whose very existence depends on the kindness of other people, someone who is vulnerable in every moment of his life and seemingly has little to offer, all of a sudden has a chance to encounter Jesus. And what he asks for is different. He reaches out. He has nothing but faith. He calls Jesus son of David, a sign of belief. Remember that word, pistis, belief and hope and trust. He is full of belief and hope and trust. James and John have been following Jesus for months, if not years. This man has just come with an earshot of him, but his faith and hope and trust is far superior, and all he wants is healing. All he wants is wholeness. All he wants is a chance to live the life that he was made to live. That I can give you, Jesus says. And the scripture tells us he immediately starts following Jesus. He's going to receive those same lessons. He's going to hear those same things that James and John saw and heard those disciples could not see what Jesus was actually all about. And Mark, in his genius, is pointing out, is the man who did not have good functioning eyesight is the one who can actually see who Christ is, what he's doing, and what following him means. Serving other people living this Christian life, orienting yourself around discipline of prayer and generosity, compassion, healing, hope, goodness in love, if you are doing it just so you can get something, will never be easy, will never be fun. But if you call out to Christ, if you humbly receive the love that he has for you, if you open yourself up to the healing of heart and mind, soul and spirit that he's offering you today and every day, if you let his grace transform you, if you let his love work through you, then all of a sudden that work of compassion, that work of generosity, that life of goodness, of hope, of support, that pouring yourself out to the point of of emptiness so that others might have just a taste of what you've seen, 
That stuff is addictive, y'all. When you're a runner and you move from have to to get to, it changes everything. When you are a person who follows Jesus, when you are a person who hears Jesus, when you are a person who experiences the grace of Christ and all of this stuff about living and following him moves from have to to get to, that changes everything. May you experience this grace, this healing, this love. May you experience this goodness, this hope, this promise. And having experienced that, may you move from, I have to live this way, to I get to live this way for the good of my soul, for the good of my family, for the good of my community, and the blessing of everybody else. What could be better? Not a thing. Let us pray. Great and loving God, great are you and greatly to be praised. Lord, help us move from have to to get to. Help us to move from a life of discipline, just being something that we have to do in order to get what we want from you, to instead receiving the grace that you poured out on us since before we were even aware, the healing that you make known to us, the good life that you offer to us, and then being so transformed, let us pour ourselves out, experiencing what it's like to give what we have to a cause so worthwhile. Lord, let us continue to walk on your way to Jerusalem, right by you, side by side ready for whatever, knowing that through it all, we are yours and you are ours. And it's in trust, hope, and faith that together we say the words that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I invite forward those who will be serving um, communion this morning, okay, I don't want to make the marathon correlations too heavy, but hear me out. In that race, right, you need to be replenished. You are poured out. You need energy. You need sustenance. You need a source. You need water. You need carbohydrates. You need more to get you through that race. In this race of life, in this daily work of discipleship and following, it is exhausting. And we need a replenishment. We need a restoration. We need a boost. We need a reconnection. It's given to us. It's made possible by Christ himself. Knowing what we would need, knowing how we would need that constant replenishment of spiritual connection and energy, he took an ordinary loaf of bread, gave thanks over it, broke it and passed it and said, take all of you and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal was over, he took a cup of ordinary table wine, gave thanks over it, blessed it and passed it and said, take all of you and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In just a moment on the ground floor, we have ushers in the rear of the room. They'll release you row by row to come to the very front. You'll have your hands held open like this. Someone with a food service glove will place a piece of bread, either regular or gluten-free, into your hands. You'll then go to the next station where someone with non-alcoholic grape juice would love to give you an offering. You can then uh, eat the bread, drink the juice, and as you return up the outside aisle, we'll have receptacles ready for you. We have a station up in the balcony on the east side as well. However, you're also welcome to come down to the floor if you would like to do so. This is not the gatherings table. This is not the First United Methodist Church's table. This is Christ's table and like his love, his grace, his power, his goodness. It is for everybody here today. Every age, every background, every understanding. This is for you. The table is set. The meal is ready. Come forward and be fed.
voice of love that's calling There's a chair that waits for you And a friend who understands Everything you're going through You keep standing at a distance In the shadow of your shame There's a light of hope that shines Won't you come and take your place So bring it all to the table Nothing he ain't seen before For all your sin, all your sorrow and your sadness There's a Savior and he calls Bring it all to the table He can see the way you and hold your heart Through the cross you've been forgiven You're accepted as you are So bring it all to the table There's nothing here
As we come to the end of our time of worship together today, just a couple quick announcements. If you're looking to find more ways to get involved, if you're checking out opportunities to get plugged in here at the church and want to know more about how life here operates, we have volunteers up at the uh, on-ramp at the front who would love to answer any questions for you. It's also a chance to find out more about volunteer opportunities. And if you are a first-time visitor or guest, we have a gift for you as well as for any kids that might be with you. So please come up and say hello. Also, we take praying together very seriously. It's a sacred way in which we can be church together. And if there's anything on your heart or mind that you'd like to pray for, in addition to those prayer cards, Pastor Virginia is up at the front at the Congregational Care Ministry sign. She would love to pray with you today. So on your way out, not sure exactly where the marathon uh, progress is, if you take Henderson Street to 10th Street and then take a right on 10th Street down to Forest Park, and you can take Forest Park out to 30, that is a guaranteed way to get through with no delays anywhere else, go with God. So best of luck. Would you please bow your heads and receive this benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face raise to shine upon you. May you run and not grow tired. May you walk and not grow weary. And may your life of serving Christ move from have to to get to. And may it bring you joy now and every day. Amen. Go in peace.